if you're looking to organize brands within one organization, you are in the right place. Hey, what's up, branding experts? Are here at Design, and in this video, I will show you the different types of brand architecture, together with some examples of famous brands, so that you can get inspired when working on your brand strategy or designing your brand identity. So you see, as your brand grows, branding might get quite complicated because if you sell a number of different products or offer various services, then they all need to be structured in some kind of a way, right? So what is a brand architecture? Brand architecture simply refers to the hierarchy of brands within one organization. And the goal of developing one is to simply bring order into chaos. And it's just a way of organizing numerous sub-brands, business departments, or product lines within one company. So as your brand grows, grows at some point you might come to conclusion that what you do is not just one brand as you grow perhaps these new entities will need some special attention so how do you organize the offering your products and your services well you need to have a clear strategy on what type of brand architecture can work for you because otherwise it can quickly all become a big mess so that's why it's important to understand how brands can relate to one another within one organization. So there are three basic models, branded house, endorsed brands, and house of brands. They can all help us decide how to arrange our brands within one company, each in a different way. Besides, there's also the fourth hybrid model, which is just a mix of the above. Each type of brand architecture comes with some strengths and weaknesses which we're gonna discuss later as well. So first, let me give you a quick overview of those brand architecture types, and then we will discuss different benefits and I'll give you more examples. First, we have branded house, which is also called a monolithic brand architecture, where the master brand, as well as all sub brands, they share the same visual identity, but with slight variations. Like for example, FedEx, they use different color for their divisions, or Apple, which uses a different name of the product. The second, we have endorsed brands, where the master brand support all sub brands, which have unique design to some extent, but they all are supported by the visibility of the master brand. For example, Nestle. And then house of brands, which is also called pluralistic, where the master brand has no linkage to sub brands, which all have totally unique identities. For example, Unilever or Procter & Gamble. And four, we have the hybrid model, which is just a mix of the above. So it usually happens when a company starts with just one product or service, and then it develops extensions. But eventually as the company grows, then totally new brands are being developed or acquired. For example, Coca-Cola. So now it all may sound strange to you at first, but believe me, it's quite easy to understand once you think about brand architecture in a certain way. Later on, when we go through those different examples of brand architecture, you will start to notice that it's all basically about answering one question. What's the dominance of the master brand? Because after all, when choosing the right model, it all comes down to deciding whether we want the master brand to influence the identity of the sub-brands and if so, to what extent. For example, they all can share the same visual identity but with small changes to it, like adding a descriptor underneath or perhaps changing the color of the logo. Or maybe all of your sub-brands should be just slightly endorsed by the equity of the master brand but new identities should be created. Or perhaps there should be no linkage whatsoever where all of your sub-brands have totally new identities and act totally independently. So to answer these questions, let's just dive in and discuss each of these models together Together with some examples of famous brands. Now first, the branded house architecture model, which is also known as monolithic, is characterized by a strong single master brand. And this is a structure where the master brand is highly dominant over all sub-brands. Or in other words, all sub-brands are derivative of that master brand, with small changes of course. So they can share the same visual identity but with slight modifications like changing the colors and adding new descriptors of course. And a great example here would be the FedEx brand architecture. But keep in mind that these images do not include all sub-brands of these companies. I just selected top three brands to keep it simple for the purpose of this video. So in this type of brand architecture, the master brand takes control over the whole operation. And this type of branding is also known as an umbrella or a corporate brand, where all sub-brands basically bear the parent's brand name and it's always visible, but with descriptors usually being placed above or below the logo. 
And branded house is also commonly referred to as brand extensions for the same reason. And another great example here would be the Apus brand architecture, where we have the master brand sitting at the top and all sub brands below the benefit from the visibility of the master brand, its logo and identity. And yet another great example here would be the Samsung's brand architecture. So similarly as with Apple, Samsung uses a monolithic architecture where all sub brands are created as a derivative of the master brand. This is the most common approach that requires the least amount of effort. However, branded house model won't work for every company. Some will benefit more than others. So here are some benefits of using the branded house architecture model. So first, they are simple to create and maintain and it's all about creating one powerful brand and customers can make choices based on brand loyalty. Product features and benefits matter less to consumers than brand promise. And some of the downsides of using the branded house architecture would be the broader the business offering is, the less meaningful the brand becomes. And it's also sensitive to PR disasters because if the master brand fails, all the sub brands will suffer as well. And new brands from mergers and acquisitions will need to be rebranded and they will lose their equity. So I just gave you my top examples, but there's more. Here we have five examples of branded house architecture. Architecture. So we have FedEx, Apple and Samsung, but also General Electric and Smithsonian, for example. Okay, so now since we discussed the first model, which is all the way to the left on our spectrum of dominance of the master brand, now moving to the right side of the spectrum, we have the endorsed brands model, where the dominance of the master brand decreases more or less. So second, the endorsed brand architecture model is characterized by some synergy between the master brand and all of the sub brands. So this is a structure where the master brand has some dominance over all of the sub brands, or in other words, all of the sub brands brands are supported by the master brand to some extent. So here totally new brands are being developed and then supported by the visibility of the master brand. However, the support of the master brand is much less significant here than in the previously mentioned branded house model. And probably the best example illustrating this would be the Virgin's brand architecture. So here we can clearly recognize the linkage between the master brand and all of their sub brands. So in this model, new brands are being created that can operate in the independently and compete in different industries or categories. So endorsed model is great if you want to benefit from the visibility of the master brand, but at the same time you want to have separate entities to be able to compete in different markets. However, you need to be very careful here as this can quickly become a big mess where the organization's portfolio look more like a Frankenstein. So that's why I have for you the second example of using the endorsed brand architecture approach, which actually illustrates better how it really should be used. So check out the Marriott's brand architecture. So as you can see, Marriott created sub brands where each has its own unique logo, but at the same time, they all benefit from the visibility of the master brand, which is placed below. So this model is great if you want to leverage the familiarity of the master brand, but at the same time you need some distinction among the variety of products that you offer. So yet another great example here would be the Kellogg's brand architecture. So similarly as with Marriott, Kellogg supports its numerous brands by showing the company logo, which in this case is placed above. Generally, the difference between the branded house model and the endorsed brands model is that in the latter, the master brand is not as visible. It's kind of hidden. So the master brand is there just to give them a bit of positive equity, but totally new and distinctive brands are being created with their own unique identities. Now, as with other types of brand architecture, there are some pros and cons of the endorsed approach. Some benefits of the endorsed brand architecture would be First, the endorsement adds to credibility, but sub brands can also have their unique look and feel. Second, all new sub brands can benefit from the positive equity of the master brand. And three, it allows you to compete in the market without alienating the existing audience. Now, some downsides of using the endorsed brand architecture would be, so first, if any sub brand goes through a crisis, it can also affect the parent brand and peer brands. So there is a higher cost and longer time to market wait for every new brand. And three, although sub brands are independent, they must align with the master brand to some extent. 
So now check out my list of five famous brands that use this endorsed model. So we have the Virgin, Marriott, Nestle, but also Kellogg's or Sony, for example. Okay, so now let's look at our graphic of the dominance of the master brand and moving all the way to the right, we have the house of brands model, which is also known as pluralistic. It's characterized by a series of totally unrelated sub brands. This is a structure where the master brand has no linkage whatsoever to any of the sub brands. Or in other words, the name of the parent company is absolutely invisible visible and so new brands are being developed where each one gets its own unique image and this program simply doesn't rely on the master brand at all where all sub brands are completely independent and they are basically positioned as new brands with their own distinctive look and feel and messaging and so on and a great example of the house of brands approach would be the Procter and Gamble's brand architecture. This is where most consumers don't even know about the existence of the master brand behind some of these famous products that we use. And so we are just familiar with the brands that we buy like Gillette razors or Tide detergent or Old Spice deodorant. And yet another and perhaps similar example here would be the Unilever's brand architecture. So again, there is a master brand which many people don't even know about unless you carefully check out the back of the packaging and spot their logo there. So similarly as with Procter & Gamble, we have a whole bunch of consumer brands here like Lipton, Axe or Dove, just to name a few. So these are the brands we love and buy and these brands target specific audiences with their distinctive look and feel, messaging and positioning in general. And I know you love seeing examples so much, so I have yet another one for you, the General Motors brand architecture. This time, this is a car company that developed a variety of car makes like Cadillac, GMC or Chevrolet, for example. And each of them is positioned differently. They have their unique features and they cater to different audiences and therefore each needs a unique brand identity. So as you are seeing these examples, you might be wondering, what are some of the benefits of using the house of brands model? So here you go. So first it allows separate sub brands to target specific niche markets or new categories. Two, it provides greater diversification of business and investment opportunities. And three, it's easy to acquire new brands from other companies or sell existing brands and allows for mergers as well. And some downsides of using the house of brands architecture. So first, it's expensive to create new sub brands, legal, creative, marketing. Second, it is a challenge to establish new brands without an endorsement. And three, it requires time and money investment in order to build awareness for those new brands. So I just gave you my top three examples, but there's more. So you have Procter & Gamble, Unilever, General Motors. We also have Volkswagen, LMHV and many others. So these were those three basic types of brand architecture that we can use to organize brands within one organization. However, there are some organizations that are so large and complex that eventually they will need to consider a mixed approach. So the hybrid model is basically a mix of the above in some configuration. Some brands may link to the master brand while others remain separate. And the hybrid model is just a combination of different models under one organization. And hybrid branding usually happens when the company starts out with just one brand and then further down the road, the brand extensions are being created as the company grows. And then the company eventually acquires or creates new separate brands to better compete in the marketplace. And this is what happened with Google as well. So they primarily use a monolithic brand architecture for their products and services like Google Pay, Gmail, Google Drive, and so on. However, they have also created other independent brands like Android or Chrome. And besides that, Google also acquired companies like YouTube or Waymo. And as you can see, this might get quite complicated. So all of this may lead to having a monolithic brand architecture on one side, but a pluralistic one on the other. And to get things even more complicated, a holding company was created 
called Alphabet. And you can read more about that on ABCXYZ. Yes, that's a real URL where the founder Larry Page explains the change. So basically, Google became now a sub brand with all of its sub brands becoming sub sub brands, if that makes any sense. So this happened because Google innovates and expands to different and often unrelated categories so that they need to make sense of all of this as a business. And similarly, Coca Cola, they started with just one product and then they created extensions or sub brands like Diet Coke, for example and eventually as the coca-cola company started growing they started acquiring and creating totally new unrelated brands and most people don't even know that for example sprite is owned by coca-cola and that's the whole point of this approach and yet another example would be here the walt disney company so on one hand they have a branded house approach with brands like the walt disney world but on the other hand, they also have independent brands like ABC or Marvel that have no linkage to Disney at all. So now let me give you a few benefits of the hybrid model. So first of all, it allows to basically get the best of both worlds. Second, it allows for mergers or acquisitions of different types of brands. And three, some brands can have a unique identity while other brands are closely related. So it's a great flexibility. Now, some downsides of using the brand architecture model would be, first of all, it can be confusing as to which sub brands should be independent and which ones should be endorsed and so on. And the second, it can be quite a challenge to keep the brand books updated across the board. And some more examples of the hybrid approach would be, of course, the aforementioned Google, Coca-Cola and Walt Disney but also Microsoft or Amazon. And so ultimately it's all about developing a solid brand strategy and envisioning the company's future growth in order to choose the right approach. Now some conclusions. So brand architecture is not only for big and established organizations because smaller brands with various products or large offering can successfully leverage brand architecture for their growth. For example, my recent client Ami Corporation asked me to design a brand architecture for the real estate business and they have extensive offering that caters to different audiences. So they needed some visual distinction between these products but there was no need to create new brands. So as you can see in this example, the logo stays the same for sub brands but colors change and we have some descriptors of course and it's quite similar to what FedEx did. Anyways, I hope these examples of brand architecture can inspire you to create your own and if you have some more interesting examples to share let me know in the comments below and if you're looking for a branding expert then go to my website and start your project there and if you like this video please give it a thumbs up and smash that subscribe button and hit notification bell as well to let you know when we've got new videos coming out until next time this was Alek Dvorniczak from eBay Design, and I will see you in the next video